A child is born after her parents have had five miscarriages before she came along. She was called the Miracle Baby. As the Miracle Child grew up, she became a kind, sweet, pretty, and a smart person. The Miracle Baby had dreams and aspirations just like any other teenager. But all those dreams were soon going to turn into a horrific nightmare. She was about to become a victim to a dreadful killing where she was multiple times in the heart. Exactly 39 years after her death, police took a man into custody after matching his DNA to blood found at the crime scene. It was an arrest that reopened the 40-year-old cold case, which was now finally solved. If intrigued, with the caution of explicit and disturbing content ahead, get on board with Haunted Hook to explore the events of this 40-year-old cold case. Are you confident that this case will be solved? No. 18-year-old high school student Michelle Martinko belonged from her hometown of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Founded in 1858 and co-educational from its start, Iowa State became the nation's first designated land-grant institution. When the Iowa legislature accepted the provisions of the 1862 Morrill Act on September 11, 1862, making Iowa the first state in the nation to do so. Iowa State is known worldwide for its student-centered culture and Michelle was a student who was an integral part of this culture. Michelle loved to dress up and style her blonde hair like Farrah Fawcett. Her family remembered her as being kind, sweet, funny, pretty and smart. She sang in the school choir and wanted to study interior design at university. Her mom Janet had five miscarriages before Michelle was born. Michelle was born when Janet was 44 and she was known as the Miracle Baby. Diagnosed with scoliosis when she was just 12, Michelle had to wear a brace for two years to straighten her spine. Once the brace came off, she started getting a lot of attention from boys. One of those boys was Andy Seidel. Michelle and Andy dated for two years before they broke up. It was Michelle who wanted to end the relationship. She later dated another boy called Mike Myrick, but Andy wasn't prepared for her to move on. After they broke up, Andy wanted to know her every move. Who was she dating? Why was she dating that particular person? And everything else that concerned absolutely anything about her. On December 19, 1979, Michelle had gone to a choir for an end-of-year celebration and then onto the mall in her hometown of Cedar Rapids, Iowa to buy a coat. At the mall, she bumped into a few of her friends from school, as well as Andy. Andy had allegedly gone to the mall to buy Michelle a Christmas present. To Andy, Michelle seemed very happy. Curtis Thomas, another boy who knew Michelle, saw her leave the mall just before closing time. I remember her smile, he said. The goodbye smile. After leaving the mall, she walked to the family car, which she'd left in a dark corner of the parking lot. She turned on the engine to warm it up and sat there for a minute. Then someone opened the door, pushed her over 29 times. One of the stab wounds to her chest penetrated her aorta and she bled to death in the car. When Michelle didn't arrive home that night, her family started to worry. Michelle's friend Jane Hansen remembered getting a call from Michelle's mother Janet, who sounded frantic. Five days before Christmas, at around 4 a.m. on the morning of December 20, police found Michelle's body in the family car, which was still in the parking lot. She was lying on the passenger side floor. She had defensive wounds from fighting her attacker. She hadn't been sexually assaulted and the cash she was carrying had not been taken. The attacker had been careful to hide his identity. He had worn rubber gloves, so he didn't leave fingerprints. A police spokesman said that everyone's instinct was to say that it was a guy, but they were not sure of the gender of the killer. Based on the number and location of stab wounds, police considered the killing to be personal in nature. At Michelle's funeral, Andy's behavior drew suspicion. Michelle's friend Gail Dawson remembered Andy being almost in the casket. Andy had his arms around her and he was just sobbing. He said to Gail that he had to know who she loved when she died. Did she love him or did she love Mike? Andy was questioned by police. 
but his mother provided an alibi for him. She said he was home from the mall by the time Michelle was murdered. Many people, including Michelle's family and friends, expected Andy to be charged, but he never was charged. He left Cedar Rapids to join the Navy. In the week after Martinko's murder, more than 200 people responded to the detective's appeals in the news for information concerning the case. Police interviewed numerous people, and several of them were cleared of suspicion through the use of a polygraph. Rumors began to circulate about the crime. Some thought that Martinko had received harassing phone calls before her death, but police stated that they did not think so. On June 19, 1980, police released a composite sketch developed based on descriptions provided by two witnesses. The description was of the man they believed stabbed Martinko. The sketch indicated a white man in his late teens or early 20s, weighing between 165 and 175 pounds and standing about 6 feet tall. Despite a sketch in hand, a description of the probable killer and 200 responses, the authorities were still not able to charge anyone with the murder. All the suspects coming in were soon cleared off. There was no solid evidence for an arrest to be made. The investigation in 1979 was a really straightforward investigation. Um, they collected you know, the evidence at the crime scene and interviewed all of Michelle's friends and any logical suspects they could come up with at the time. Michelle's parents, Janet and Albert, died in the 1990s, believing that Andy had killed their daughter. In 2006, 27 years after Martinko's killing, a new cold case investigator working for the Cedar Rapids Police Department became the investigator of this case. He discovered what he believed to be the killer's blood while he was reviewing the case files. From that, police were able to build a partial DNA profile. The results of the test for partial DNA were entered into the combined DNA index system, the National DNA Database, but no matches were found. Eventually, more than 125 people would have their DNA swabbed and compared against samples taken from the scene. Out of more than 80 potential suspects that had been identified over the years, more than 60 people were tested and eventually cleared of suspicion. Finally, they were able to take this blood and turn the blood over to an individual that could do DNA phenotyping. In 2017, a company specializing in DNA phenotyping was hired to create additional images of the killer based solely on DNA clues about facial appearance and ancestry. The images looked considerably different from the 1980 composite sketch and showed a man with blonde hair and blue eyes. The company also produced approximations of how the man would have aged in the years since the crime. In a press conference during which the new image was shared, a former classmate of Martenko exclaimed that the face looked like another one of their classmates. But that classmate had been investigated and was cleared based on a DNA swab several years before. In 2018, the DNA phenotyping company took the data they had collected the year before and entered it into GED Match, a public genealogy website that has been used by law enforcement to solve other cold cases, most famously that of the Golden State Killer. GED Match returned one person who shared DNA markers with the suspect in Martenko's murder, and it determined them to be likely the killer's second cousin once removed. The company created a family tree starting with four sets of the woman's great-great-grandparents and reported that the killer was most likely descended from one of those couples. An investigator with the Cedar Rapids Police Department contacted DNA-tested members of two of the branches of the family tree and eliminated those branches as containing the killer. He then contacted a member of a third branch and a DNA test determined that they were first cousins with the killer. That narrowed the suspects down to a set of three brothers who had grown up in Manchester, Iowa. The brothers were placed under surveillance, and investigators began to attempt to collect their DNA secretly. On October 29, 2018, an investigator observed one of the brothers, Jerry Lynn Burns, drink multiple sodas using a plastic straw. When Burns disposed of the straw, the investigator collected it and tested it for DNA. 
test eliminated the other two brothers as suspects, but the DNA from Burns' trauma matched the blood found on Martinko's clothing. On December 19, 2018, investigators went to Burns' business in Manchester, Iowa to interview him. He refused to voluntarily provide a sample of DNA, but was compelled to do so with a search warrant. His hands and arms were also examined for scars possibly left by the assumed cuts sustained during the attack. Burns maintained that he did not know Martenko and was not there when she died. Going up on an old case, I don't know if you've heard it in the news at all. It's a homicide that happened at Westdale Mall. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Martenko, is that something you've ever heard of? Yeah. Although an investigator later testified that Burns did not specifically deny killing Martenko, he was not able to provide an explanation for why his DNA would have been present at the crime scene. Burns showed almost no emotion during the interview, even when he was eventually told that he was being arrested. When asked if he had killed someone that night in 1979, Burns repeatedly told investigators to test his DNA. Did you murder someone that night, Jerry? Test the DNA. Jerry. Test the DNA. Why did this happen, Jerry? Test what, the DNA. What happened? When the DNA sample was tested, it matched a blood sample found at the crime scene. On December 19, 2018, exactly 39 years after Martinko's murder, Burns was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He entered a plea of not guilty. His trial was originally scheduled for October 14, 2019, but in September, the defense requested a delay in order to gather more evidence and interview witnesses. The defense also requested the trial to be moved out to Lynn County. The prosecution did not resist either request, and the trial was rescheduled for February 10, 2020 in Scott County. The murder trial began on February 12, 2020, the prosecution emphasized the unlikelihood of the DNA evidence matching someone other than the person who left it at the scene. The doctor who performed Martenko's autopsy and investigators in the original case took the stand to testify to how investigation was conducted and to Martenko's cause of death. The defense argued that DNA evidence had been mishandled and that different articles of clothing from the scene should not have been stored together in one evidence bag. Prosecutors also played a video of a police interview of Burns, in which he denied being at the crime scene on the night of Martinko's murder, and could not explain how his DNA had been found at the scene. They also played a later recording after Burns' arrest, in which Burns questioned whether he could have blocked out the memory of committing the crime. The defense brought only one witness, a self-described forensic DNA consultant, who testified on the possibility that police could have mishandled the evidence. He stated that Burns' DNA could have been at the scene due to secondary transfer, such as skin cells transferring to an article of clothing when someone brushes up against another person. Although he clarified that it was not his opinion that this was the case with Burns' DNA, prosecutors called the criminalist to contradict the defense's witness. The criminalist said that the storage of Martinko's clothing was not unusual. On February 24, 2020, after three hours of deliberation, the jury found Jerry Lynn Burns guilty of first-degree murder of Michelle Martinko. Iowan law mandated a life sentence without the possibility of parole for first-degree murder. On May 29, 2020, Burns' attorney filed a motion asking for a new trial claiming his constitutional and state rights were violated and that the court made a mistake in overruling the request for evidence to be suppressed. Finally, on August 7, 2020, Burns was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In September 2020, Burns filed a notice of appeal. Burns is currently still imprisoned in the Animosa State Penitentiary. In a way, Michelle was there in that trial. She was there because she fought so hard and she struggled, and she fought so hard that she caused the killer to cut himself. And with that cut, he left his blood, and with that blood, he left his DNA, which solved the mystery. What do you guys think? Was it Michelle who finally helped the detectives to solve the case of her own murder? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked the video, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, 
share this video and hit that bell icon to never miss an update on more such cold cases.